Hi, my name is Harish, and I welcome you to this talk that I'm, I have uh, entitled OSPO versus Inner Source. Uh, is that a misnomer? I'm hoping to be able to go through this uh, session with you for the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes to figure out uh, what it is that, uh, you know, from my perspective, looking at what uh, Inner Source uh, has been able to achieve and where it should be going to in terms of what is the big uh, uh, big game, big long-term game that we need to be playing uh, from an open source and inner source perspective. Uh, so my name is Harish and I'm with Red Hat. I'm with the open source program office and I'm based out of Singapore. Um, let me just uh, uh, move on to the next slide. The question is why do open source? Why are we doing this? Why are we here in this event in the first place? Um, there are um, long-term uh, plays that bring out uh, some tangible and sustainable benefits for organizations. Uh, we can't deny that there is. And in fact, uh, a lot of the ideas that has been uh, derived over the years, especially with the inner source patterns uh, project, I think does, does show that there are very useful outcomes that are, have been uh, you know, documented and presented on how inner source can help organizations. But I think the bigger picture had, that has to be asked is, are these um, outcomes sustainable? Are they tangible? And benefits the larger group within an organization and outside the organization? So, um, well, I, one of the things I like is uh, highways. So, you know, when you look at a highway, the way it's designed, it, it just goes all over the place. I mean, this is a phenomenal highway. I think this is somewhere in, in England. Um, and, you know, looking at all the connections, it's just uh, mind boggling when you look at engineering that goes behind it, the design, the safety, the quality of the you know, materials and so on. So if you take this as, an, as, as a kind of a roadmap of sorts, you know, we're going around in circles in many ways. But the question here is, what does it actually mean? Um, what is the destination for, for inner source? What does it, uh, where does it bring us? Is it just cultural change? Uh, in previous um, summits, we had many speakers have spoken about how do you and, uh, get change in an organization to be able to do inner source. A lot of it, and my colleagues, uh, Katrina, uh, has uh, spoken about uh, cultural change and what needs to be done and how do you make sure that uh, these things are sustainable. So is it about cultural change? Is it about organizational change? Do organizations have to change and adapt to be able to do inner source? And is it about happier developers? So are we looking at making sure the developers that are part of this ecosystem within an organization are happy and able to not have to reinvent the wheel every time something needs to be done because somebody else in the organization has already done it and they can now start um, uh, taking it and benefiting from it and contributing back within the organization. Are these the kinds of uh, outcomes that we are looking for? Another picture of a highway. You know, some of these highways are very clean, very straightforward. This is a, a picture uh, in, in Singapore. So what is the end goal for inner sourcing? What would it be? And after you have achieved inner sourcing, what happens? What is the next stage after inner source? There is, and there has to be something that goes beyond just inner sourcing and a project or, or, or activity within an organization. Do inner source projects have open source aspirations? I think there is. I think, and I'll conjecture that when I grow up, I want to be an open source project. It's probably what every inner you know, source project is probably thinking about. They may not articulate it in that manner because probably they, they haven't figured it out. But I, I would posit that it is something that we will be seeing a lot more of, of inner source projects because it helps to gain a certain level of traction, a certain level of adoption, which makes a significant impact on all the participants within an inner source project for it to become an open source project. So what does that actually imply? More highways, more twists and turns and, 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 and uh, you know, flyovers and what have you, right? It, it is going to be a journey 
and part of the journey is having fun along the way as well. Now, I would posit again that open source is essentially the gold standard to uh, aspire to. Because if you are reaching that gold standard, that means, and it has been shown across the industry over the last 20, 25 years, that open sourced projects and products have set the gold standard on how to collaborate, how to solve issues, how to uh, uh, address uh, uh, open issues out there that needs to be solved and so on. So open sourcing has become essentially the gold standard. But when did it become the gold standard? Or am I just pulling a fast one here? There is this notion of an overturn window. I will leave you to uh, look it up on Wikipedia. But I would suggest that the Overton uh, window started opening up at around the year 2000. That's when you found organizations, for example, Red Hat in 1999 was listed on the stock exchange, an open source company that is now driving parts of the economy at that point in time. And this changes how people start adopting and looking at uh, solutions that are available in front of them. And I will also say that the Overton uh, window for enterprise open source software started opening up in 2000 and it became accelerated from about 2010 or so. Where you have enterprises that were now deploying it across all the, uh, their needs from very critical, mission critical systems down to mundane systems. Yes, a lot of the systems that were mundane were the ones that got open source into organizations. But now you're, you're beginning to see mission critical uh, in stock exchanges of the world, airlines, uh, the, the, the US Federal Aviation Authority deploying open source software for their uh, monitoring of aircraft and stuff like that. That changes how organizations perceive and consume open source across the world. So from about 20, uh, from the year 2000 and then accelerating from 2010, I feel that the op enterprise open source use has become essentially prevalent. I'm not the only one saying this. We did a survey, um, again, more bridges. Um, we did, a, uh, Red Hat did a survey of um, enterprise open source uh, 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 leaders around the world, um, especially IT leaders as well. And uh, in this report that came up in 2020, it was uh, noted that 86% of IT leaders were of the opinion that most innovative companies were using enterprise open source. The key thing here is that innovative companies, it's not that, not just any old company trying to use open source software, innovation. Where can I make innovation happen? How can I make that happen for my organization? Innovation is a very messy thing. Innovation is the opposite of, uh, of, of efficiency, all right? You have to keep that in mind. You cannot innovate and expect efficiency. The end result of innovation can lead to efficiency, but the process of innovation is a very messy thing. It's not uh, efficient enough. But with open source technology, you can arrive at a quicker amount, uh, a level of innovation, which is you know, as exemplified by the percentages. 86% is a very large number. I would encourage you to please visit and read the report that was that came out uh, a few months ago. That report also highlighted that across the board, open source software has higher quality. I mean, to, to, we, we inherently know that. But when you talk to people who are consuming the technology, if this is what they come back with and say, this are their experience. So shouldn't inner source projects also get to that level of uh, gold standards, which is essentially becoming an open source project itself. Because the, uh, the benefits of open source is very clear, it's understood, everybody knows that. What's holding us back to get to that level? And I would therefore suggest that let's look at this entire continuum, the inner source to open source continuum. In a scale of one to five, where one is silo inner source projects, and two is inner source projects accessible to internal teams, maybe within the same organization, maybe across the same 
organization in different countries, perhaps. Uh, at level three will be inner source projects, including external partners. That means the people who they collaborate with were not necessarily part of the organization. This is not the same as internal teams, it's external partners. At level four, inner source projects will start including external uh, partners and perhaps a limited bunch of community members, perhaps. And to me, number five was, is when you open it up to the whole world. That, to me, is the gold standard. When you do that, you have arrived. And you can now start uh, reaping the benefits of being fully open and accessible from the whole world. Another report in the same, uh, another uh, uh, insight from the same report was saying that 95% of the respondents were saying that open source is strategically important for them. Now, if something is strategically important, that says a lot. The word strategically important is a very critical business perspective. If I don't do this, my business will not be able to have a good shot at being successful. If 95% of these respondents say that, clearly there is significant value in it. If these organizations want to make sure that they benefit to the fullest extent possible, inner source projects should also become open source. So this is where I would probably want to bring in the open source program offices. I'm not going to discuss what open source program offices are all about. And I think that's a separate conversation on its own. But there's a lot of in, uh, interest in how OSPOS can possibly help. A lot of organizations are already uh, implementing OSPOS across uh, their, uh, their entities and collaborating with external entities as well, including universities, governments, and uh, a lot of other research organizations that are funded through public funds to make sure that what they create is then released out to the general public. What an open source program office can offer, are, you know, I just listed five things here, but I think this is essentially to highlight the critical, the criticality, especially uh, part C, which is saying getting open source project uh, adoption by graduating in the source projects to become open source. So when you do that, an open source program office will be an ideal conduit to make sure that you can successfully bring inner source projects to become open source capable, open source communities to be able to consume, collaborate, and turn it into even open source products at the end of the day. Again, pictures of the, of the various uh, uh, freeways around the world. Uh, you know, this is one of the things I look at maps. When I look at maps, I love this. It does show me that there is a way forward. There, is, uh, there are twists and turns along the way, I agree but there is a way forward. And if there is one slide that, I, that you want to take from this, I hope you will take this one slide. It is a roadmap. It, it shows us a straight line, but as you saw, you know, uh, it's straight lines are not necessarily straight. But the point is, we do have a goal that you want to achieve, and that is being a gold standard by becoming an open source project, not just an internal of our inner source only type of project. So with that, I thank you very much, and I look forward to getting your questions. Thank you.